Hello class, welcome to lecture four. And in this lecture, we're going to be introducing centripetal slash centrifugal force and exploring some of the physical consequences of these forces as it pertains to uh, Earth, our global system. So with that, we'll go ahead and dive into it. So one thing that should be pointed out from the get-go is that these are quote unquote apparent forces, which means they're not true forces, uh, which means that it's not something that we can really measure it's just uh those are just uh, by apparent forces we mean a force that is just a consequence of being in a non-inertial reference frame these aren't forces that you can observe in any rush reference frame such as say gravity is something you observe whether in you're in a non-inertial or an inertial reference frame and uh uh, other forces like a pressure gradient force that doesn't depend on inertial or non-inertial reference frame. Those are true or absolute forces. Apparent forces do depend on reference frame. And in the case of centripetal and centrifugal force, and as we'll also see Coriolis force, the reason why these forces even exist is because of the fact that we are in fact in a non-inertial reference frame. So that's what is meant by apparent forces. Apparent forces uh, depend on the reference frame, whereas a true force or an absolute force does not. And one thing that should be noted that's kind of important is the fact that both centripetal and centrifugal force act perpendicular to the velocity vector. So if you're traveling north, and it's, let's say you're initially traveling north in a circular path, that means your centripetal force and centrifugal force will be pointing at right angles. And we'll see a diagram to sort of illustrate that. So your centripetal force, depending on the direction of the circle, might be pointing eastward or it might be pointing westward. It all depends on uh, what direction you're traveling in the circle. But the main takeaway message is since we have, since these quote unquote forces act perpendicular to the velocity vector, that means that, that basically means that the, the, the only thing that it changes is the direction of the velocity vector. It doesn't change the actual speed. There's no real, there's no change in the object's speed. All that's going on is a change to the object's direction. That's the only thing that these forces, uh, that these forces cause is a change in the direction, not, not in the speed of an object. So. These are two forces that arise from a non-inertial reference frame, specifically a rotating reference frame. So again, let's say we have an example of a velocity vector that's pointing from south to north. Now, the centripetal force is what maintains the object's circular path. So this is a, uh, this is a force that points inward towards the center of the circle. If you can imagine an object that's traveling in circular motion, then the centripetal force points toward the center of the circle, and that's what maintains the object's circular trajectory. Now, the centrifugal force is something that arises from Newton's third law. And Newton's third law states that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. If there's a force pointing toward the center of the circle that's maintaining this circular path or the circular trajectory, then there must be an equal and opposite force, force that's equal to the centripetal force but pointing in the opposite direction, acting on this object as well. And that's where the centrifugal force enters the story. And the centripetal force is directed inward, and that maintains the circular trajectory, whereas the centrifugal force, that's what the object quote-unquote feels as a result of this circular motion. That's usually the force that we have to account for when we go to work with our equations of motion. So centripetal, just again, centripetal force, centripetal center-seeking force, that's what maintains the object's circular trajectory. Centrifugal force is what the object quote-unquote feels as a result of the circular motion. So that's sort of a conceptual overview of how these forces work. Now we'll actually get into how to quantify this. And I do want to actually walk through a derivation to sort of show you where the, centripetal, the equation for centripetal force comes from, or centrifugal force. They're, they're of equal magnitude, it's just one has an opposite sign because it points in the opposite direction. But they're uh, mathematically, they're almost identical with the exception of a negative sign. So if we centripetal force is more or less a mass normalized force or an acceleration, especially as we're thinking about, uh, remember we're really thinking in terms of mass normalized forces, so we want the force divided by mass, and that will in turn give us the centripetal acceleration. So you may remember from physics classes that uh, centripetal force is mass times velocity squared or speed squared over the radius. And if you divide that by mass, you just simply get V squared over R, but I do want to show you where exactly that equation comes from. And it does involve a little bit of geometry, but uh, I do think that this is worthwhile to show just so, just so that you guys can actually see where that equation comes from.
So if we're looking to calculate this acceleration, and we could just pick two different points along the path. So we can say this point, we call that point one, which has this velocity vector v1, and we have this velocity vector v2 at some later time. And you can see it travels some distance delta x, which is highlighted in red here. And what we want to do is we want to calculate an acceleration. Well, if we're going to calculate an acceleration, we need to know what the change in velocity is. And if we're calculating the change in velocity, then we'd have to do a vector subtraction. We have to take the velocity at the later time, v2, and take that and subtract it from the velocity at the earlier time, which is v1. So we want to evaluate what this uh, vector sum is right here, the vector of v2 minus the vector of v1. So if we take vector v2 and then use the tail on tip method and then add that to the negative of vector v1, we get a result that looks like this. And then the resultant, which is the end result of those two vectors, or the result of adding those two vectors, would look something like this. So delta v is the green vector that's highlighted here. Now one thing that uh, helps us sort of uh, complete this derivation is the fact that we end up with two similar triangles here. So uh, in fact, there's specifically there are two similar isosceles triangles because remember this centripetal force does not change the speed. I want to make sure I draw a clear distinction there. Velocity is both magnitude and direction. Speed is just magnitude. Speed is the scalar. The speed does not change. The velocity vector does change. It only changes direction, but the speed is the same. So that means the magnitude of v1 is equivalent to the magnitude of v2. So if you take this vector sum that we have here, this is in fact an isosceles triangle. And if you look at the diagram that we have over here, if you look at the radius r, Again, the definition, by the very definition of a circle, the radius must be the same. So that means that this, at every point along the circle, so that means that this also has to be an isosceles triangle. And you can also go to, sh you can also show that these two are quote unquote similar triangles. And there's a special geometric property that we can use to work with uh, similar triangles, which we're going to go ahead and show. So a bit of a geometry of view. If you have two similar triangles, then the ratio of the respective sides of each triangle should all equal the same number. So if we take a look at side A on this triangle on the left-hand side and side A on the triangle on the right-hand side, again color-coded, so this triangle is blue, this triangle is green, and the variables are also color-coded appropriately. So by the definition of similar triangles, that means that A1 divided by A2, that ratio, must be equal to b1 divided by b2, which must be equal to the other sides that correspond c1 over c2, and all of those ratios must be equal to the same constant which I've given the name lambda down here. So that's the geometric definition of similar triangles, is the ratio of each respective side must be equal to the ratio of the other respective sides, and those all must be equal to the same constant. And we can use that fact to uh, derive the centripetal force from this equation or the centripetal acceleration from this equation. We do in fact have two similar triangles here, but we have to consider the magnitude of these vectors to actually get a triangle because right now we have a bunch of vectors and if we want to see, if we want to focus on something more geometric, which is the fact that this is a triangle, we have to take the magnitude of each side. So we consider the magnitude of V2 and the magnitude of V1 which are the lengths of these two sides, and the length of this side would just be the magnitude of delta v, which is the vector difference between those two. And if we link that up to the similar triangle that we have over here, it means the ratio of this side, which is the odd side, which is not the, the these two sides, we have, remember we have an isosceles triangle, so one side's gonna be different, so the ratio of the different sides, delta v over delta x, that should be equal to the ratio of the other sides. And since v1 and v2 are equal in magnitude, they have different directions, but we can use that fact to uh, relate this side, the, uh, the same sides of the isosceles triangle to this value r over here, which also represents the two sides that are identical in the isosceles triangle. So we can take those ratios and set them equal to each other. So we take delta v over delta x, which is the ratio of one of the sides, and the other corresponding sides would be the ratio of our, the magnitude of our velocity vector. Remember, magnitude of v2 and v1 are the same. And then we link that up to the side r on this other triangle, and we end up with this equation here. And if we want to, we can make that a little bit neater by dividing by, or multiplying both sides by delta x so that we get a delta v on one side of the equation and a delta x on the other side of the equation.
So you, after all that geometry, this is what we end up with. And remember, the end goal of this is to find some sort of expression for acceleration. And the best way to do, so we have what the change in velocity is, or the magnitude of the change in speed. So if we want to determine what that acceleration is, we can just simply divide both sides of this equation by some time increment delta t. So we divide this side of the equation by delta t, and we divide this side of the equation by delta t. And if we do that, we get a result that looks like this. And then over here on the left-hand side, I just simply have an expression for acceleration. And over on the right-hand side, I just simply have an, ex an expression for the speed of an object, which is uh, the distance and traveled over some time. So if I make those substitutions, we get that the magnitude of the acceleration is equal to the magnitude of the velocity, or just simply the speed, squared divided by the radius of the circle, which can kind of simplify down to that. And we can also do something to this by using some uh, an identity from uh, angular motion, which again kind of goes back to, uh, is sort of a throwback to your physics classes, where you can write the quote unquote linear speed is equal to the angular velocity times the radius of the circle. And if you make that substitution and cancel out some terms, you'll get that the centripetal acceleration is equal to the speed squared divided by the radius of the circle, but that's also equal to the angular velocity squared times the radius of the circle. And this is going to be something that's going to be kind of important to keep in mind, especially as we relate this back to our Earth system, uh, which will be a topic for the next segment. But that's going to do it for the introduction and the derivation of centripetal force. And in the subsequent segments, we'll talk about some of the physical consequences of centripetal and centrifugal force. So with that, I will see you all in the next segment.